السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome dear listeners to this episode of Saudi Evenings. Tonight we are joined by uh, Mr. Aqil Muhammad Aqil, the management consultant, and we're going to be talking about the organizational management issues and probably some titles underneath that big title related to HR, uh, employees, uh, IT experts probably within the organizations, probably the developments uh, somehow in the organization, either it's from the uh, management side or from the employees or human resources side at large. So uh, welcome to the program, Mr. Aqil Muhammad Aqil. Uh, thank you very much. It's nice to be with you, and uh, good evening to our listeners over there. It's nice to have you, actually. And Mr. Aqil, as you know, the topic is very wide, of course, and we cannot cover it in one episode, but we're trying to highlight some important elements, probably, out of this big topic. Yeah, so sure. th- the title, or the big title for this, probably is the Organizational Management Issues. And in order to start, let's just pave the way for the listeners in order to give them some introduction. Then we can start from there talking about the elements of that topic. Uh, Thank you. Let us uh, start by uh, reminding that it's human capital is the bigger, actually, umbrella to discuss human resources issues. And it's so essential for any, actually, organizational development, not only organizational development, also societal development. As we know that Saudi Arabia is just launching the Vision 2030, and this is uh, so important to develop the human resources for the future. Uh, And uh, it's not only about education. It's not only about uh, uh, just hiring people and offering jobs for uh, the the, uh, or just kill the unemployment. It's actually about competing across the whole world. Uh, everybody is looking at the kingdom, and this is very interesting topic to handle from this perspective. Well, this is actually a very nice uh, thing that you just mentioned in the introduction. I mean, of course, as the HR is very, very essential element of the Vision 2030, and probably the transformation program, the Saudi transformation program, uh, relies heavily probably on the human resources. As you said, it's not just about uh, hiring people or uh, filling the uh, vacancies. It's about the knowledge probably about the equipping those employees with the skills or the knowledge that they require in order to perform their jobs uh, right from the beginning. So and they can progress along Uh, while they are moving from one place to another within the organization or across organizations probably from one company to another. So the uh, private sector probably is going to play a great role in that transformation because all we know, the governments all over the world, they are not the main employer for people. So there will be the government and the private sector They put hand in hand together and they create this atmosphere for the human resources to grow. Uh, Well, uh, I would love actually to remind that uh, one of the bestseller books in the maybe 90s was uh, by uh, Hamel and Pralahide. It's about competing for the future, how we can prepare our societies to compete for the future. How can we actually prepare our organizations? Uh, during the last maybe few decades, there were lots of uh, corporate uh, companies uh, who have actually some sound impact on the societies and on the economics. But uh, unfortunately, they failed to continue and they failed to sustain. Uh, Bralite and Hamel, they discuss uh, the capabilities building part of the strategy. It's not only about growing uh, profit or growing the top line and you know making more money t- for the shareholders. We have to, we have to uh, consider building our capabilities. And of course, most of the capabilities is just uh, focused within the HR part or the human part. The human part is the real treasure, which lasts actually. And uh, while uh, keep building our human resources, we continue to sustain. We only. Uh, we also should consider the motivational part. 
human resources is the treasure and we have to build the skills okay from one side building the skills is essential so as we can compete and continue the innovation cycle continue the competitiveness but in order to do that we have to be ready with our motivation our loyalty of the uh, consider the belonging the human resources should be probably rewarded very well they should be considering the the company or the uh, the workplace, uh, their own home, so uh, they can continue to compete and they just uh, exploit their uh, capabilities. And this is very essential, and uh, it needs this kind of leadership in the organizations who can facilitate this for them. Okay, so this is probably uh, a, a cornerstone of our discussion for tonight. Right. So when we talk about HR, of course, there are uh, so many. Uh, topics underneath, underneath that big topic. And for example, when we talk about the employees uh, and their readiness for the uh, organizational probably transformation or change, because as you know, the organizations most of the time, they change internally. Of course. They adopt new systems, new techniques, they adopt new skills in order to compete. Otherwise, they will be remaining the same for you know mm-hmm. period of time then they will be uh, passed by the competitors so how do you see this uh, from the hr point of view i mean why this is very essential for the hr for any hr department in any organization to keep this transformation alive in the organization uh, thank you very much this is a very good question and uh, it's related to our uh, tonight topic uh, when it comes to transformation let us focus on the definition what we mean by transformation we know that change is the only constant uh, the whole world is encountering lots of changes every day because of new inventions a new actually you know the competition around the globe new competitive uh, competitiveness coming to one country or one society so uh, any organization is under severe pressures from around to maintain and to struggle and to sustain its existence first of all then to just get some expansion and to maybe acquire new markets and uh, go to new products and new new services so transformation is very essential it's part of our life it's not something new i can say it's something as maybe old as history uh, but it's coming differently every time. So, for example, the latest transformation we are encountering is very tightly related to the uh, technology, to the IT specifically, and the telecommunication. Uh, after uh, this uh, wave of telecom and, you know, IT transformation, now we are witnessing some uh, knowledge level rather than just facilitation of data and uh, uh, applications. Now we are looking for big data uh, which actually need new skills from our HR. I can say our H- our human resources, let's say, our HR is uh, the real partner that we have to consider them as a partner, not as a tool in our hands as a management to just uh, do something for a certain extent. No, they are on the core of it, and we have to start uh, changing our strategic perspective for the human resources in order to uh, carry out this role and to help them realize this. We cannot do this without uh, directly communicating with them and uh, uh, reach together to make a kind of dialogue. Dialogue, by the way, it's Latin term that actually coming like we learn together, dialogue. And in front of it, of course, there is the monologue where one person is speaking. So uh, in e-transformation, HR, human resources, capabilities, and the first of all, the motivation, uh, the buy-in, and the stay-in of them. Maybe management, uh, imagine the CEO, board of directors, what? maybe probably the minister, the deputy minister, they will just uh, push some actually motivational messages for a while. We feel this is good, but it deteriorates over time. It will not sustain for a long time. So we need to uh, amalgamate the human resources with the management and the leadership style so as we can actually sustain this e-transformation and get ready for the new wave of the e-transformation. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Aqil, usually any uh, employees, they fear change because they are used to some mm-hmm. systems or something. And when, when they talk about transformation or change in the organization, 
most of the people will be panicking mm -hmm. because they don't know what to expect. How can the HR overcome this fear and make it easy on the employees and make them actually to adapt to change rather than to be resistant? Um, another good question. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, the best uh, in this uh, topic specifically in the change resistance, let's say, uh, one of the models, it's called the roller coaster of the change. The roller coaster, we know this kind of games in the, you know, where we can actually have this speed of just going down, then uh, God knows what will happen or uphill. Uh, one of the good thinkers in this is uh, Stephen Hines. He's having some uh, model for uh, leadership to be aware of the resistance, how it happened, and how actually they should tackle it, and they should actually avoid it probably in the first place. But he said actually it is not avoidable. When you announce a new change, for example, certain process which is semi-automated will be replaced by a new process. Or we will start serving our customers, probably our constituents, uh, through e-service. Now, this kind of organizational change, the time you announce it, there will be lots of depression. People will have a shock because maybe some uh, workers or some employees are probably benefiting out of the current. Maybe they are afraid they will not be able to learn the new things. They are doubtful about their capabilities. This is one of the good reasons, for example, to avoid or to try to resist the change. Uh, of course, there is uh, what we call political we have the formal organization and we have the informal organization, which uh, formed inside the organization with relationships, with some loyalties, belonging to many things. Consider the racism, consider the, uh, you know, certain workers who are actually belonging to one ideology, probably. They form a kind of hidden organization or hidden group in the organization. When we announce change, directly those people will make the communication and they will have some point of view, opinion towards the change. Either it is supportive to the change or it is not. So wise leadership and wise management will consider this kind of, uh, let's say, realities. I can say it's a reality inside the organization. We, can, we may reduce it, we may lessen it somehow, but, but we have to just uh, admit that it's there. Now, when it comes to resisting change, as Ber uh, Stephen Hines, Dr. Stephen Hines' uh, model, he said that we will start by having this uh, chalk. Then there will be lots of, you know, rumors and uh, depression, where morals will go down, the product productivity will also will slow down, people are afraid, are we uh, going to have our jobs uh, secured? Probably there will be some changes. There will be lots of hazard. Then he said there will be l the bottom line, where the roller coaster will reach the let's say ground level and in preparation either to stop at this point or to just move with hope he said the another or the next stage is the hope building which is a very essential one and the main uh, let's say player in this is the leadership the leadership if they actually continue communicating with the people listening to their complaints why they are not accepting the change uh, being frank uh, with them, not actually sometimes uh, uh, packaging the bad news with some sweets or uh, then the performing will come. The, the, the next stage will be actually, yes, adopting the new model, which is actually the change is about to be deployed. The new system is there. I'm not saying new system of computer system. Of course, it's the new actually process or the new way of serving our customers, whatever it is. At that point, we will start having a new body a new life okay in the organization we used to be in this position now we are in a better position to compete to sustain our competitiveness maybe to gain new markets however this is very long story but i would love to just uh, make it short yeah of course okay i think uh, with that we come to a uh, short break and to continue stay tuned Welcome back, dear listeners, to this episode of Saudi Evenings. Tonight we are joined by Mr. Aqal Muhammad Aqal, the management consultant. And we're talking about uh, management issues and probably organizational management issues. So Mr. Aqal, uh, or Aqal uh, Muhammad Aqal, 
We talk most of the time about human resources in general, but let's be a little bit specific. And human resources is a very big topic. So let's highlight some of the best practices in the human resources for managers or for leaders or for, you know, any people who are involved in this profession. Uh, great. We can actually start by having, uh, first of all, the right resources. Uh, the human resources, let's say, journey starts by planning for the human resources, first of all. Uh, I actually witnessed this several times where people will start hiring because of maybe availability of budgets, for example, or they think that the market is expanding and they need some people. So they will start capturing quickly the uh, resource of the market, but uh, they have no exact role for those people. So we have the person, then they will start having his job description or his actually specific roles and responsibilities. So they hire before they are ready for yeah. this hiring. This is what I think. First of all, we have to start by the right planning. For the, We have to, acquire, to understand our strategy, our market actually competitiveness, why we need these resources, where we will be deploying them, which exact roles we are supposed to start, uh, let's say, filling these uh, specific jobs. And once we decide on this, we have to go for the hiring process. At that point, in order to maintain a healthy human resources, we have to screen very well. We have also to validate the actually pretend or the, the, the claimed capabilities because you see the resource from his resume, uh, specifically in uh, the mid range and top line uh, uh, resource hiring. We have to be very careful to bring the right person because you know he will be leaving his job, he will be actually sometimes relocating from his uh, uh, let's say city to another city. So we have to be careful to bring the right people who will be easily amalgamated with the current resources will be easily actually enrolled in our system. They will be coming from different organizations. They have their own thoughts, their own practices. Now we will be moving them probably to another industry. This is a personal change at the human resource level. In addition to that, we are actually bringing some new, let's say, blood to our organization. We have to be careful about this flood. Now, once we decided on a certain people and we started the hiring process, the negotiation, all this stuff together, I think we have to maintain, and this is sometimes lost step in uh, many organizations, that they don't have the enrollment stage or what we call the welcome. They will just hire the resource and they expect next time, he, next day, he will start performing with, let's say, agreeable capacity. We cannot say full capacity. But they expect that a few weeks he will be one of the resources. Many people, because the human is adaptive, will be able to do this step. And they will just uh, like the professional player. They will join the team. Next day they will just uh, be part of the big organization. And uh, they have a motivation. They want to prove themselves. This is actually what motivates them. And we need, we need this motivation to continue. We don't want them to start performing with the top high performance then suddenly we'll find that they probably lost interest. Why? Because we failed to enroll them very well. We failed to actually give them a kind of, uh, you know, rotation just to uh, let them know the organization, know the structures, uh, meet the people who are supposed to coordinate their work with. Now later, and if we actually manage this stage successfully, we may actually go for the second level. Now the worker is working or the employee is working uh, with the organization for some time, probably one year, two years, two years. This is long enough that the person will start having a kind of repetitive work. Probably his performance will start deteriorating over time. Uh, probably he will start thinking that he's not getting enough as a remuneration or whatever. So we'll start thinking about how we can manage their performance and start building their capabilities, enhancing their capabilities, maybe giving them a new opportunities for improving themselves again and, you know, grow with the organization. It's a kind of parallel growing. Organization will grow in terms of market, in terms of uh, competition, probably uh, revenue, and the worker himself or the employee should find something. As, and the last one, probably, how we can help them start having a new uh, position probably because they after a few years three four five years they deserve to be now in a better position probably have more roles and responsibilities 
I can conclude one by one thing. It is uh, the Herzberg, Frederick Herzberg is one of the thinkers in the human resources and he articulated very nice model since uh, 1965. Uh, and he is having his famous book, uh, Work and the Nature of Man. And he articulated a model, it's still valid up to this moment. And he said that what motivates people is not the remuneration they receive or the salary they receive. It's the level of responsibility. It is uh, the award they receive. Sometimes thank you letter is much better than actually a, a few days vacation. Uh, the, ro the responsibility they have, the work itself, w do they actually feel that they are doing something important? The ownership. Yeah, the ownership of the work itself, uh, being part of the success. And he considered the other things, which is like the salary, like the work environment, the luxury life they live. This is, uh, this is what he called the hygiene part of that game. Hygiene, this is essential things. Work will feel less motivated probably if his salary is not enough. And it will continue to be not enough because always man will have new things to spend and, you know, expand his... Uh, like he's growing. Yeah, his, you know, uh, disposable income in this uh, economic sector. So this is a quick review, probably. Of course, this is a model I actually uh, researched one day and it's published on the LinkedIn. However, we can just maybe have some other topic as well. Right. Thank you. What about the uh, the role in this best practice of the organization leaders? I mean, usually the leader is different from the manager. Yeah, this is a good debate, and on uh, the internet there were lots of uh, articles discussing the difference between leadership and management. However, every person in any position, in any managerial position, he's practicing both. Uh, roles, the management level and the leadership level. But when it goes up to the organizational structure, the leadership role will increase too much in, in front of the managerial role. So leadership about setting the tune, uh, uh, designing the future for the organization, uh, uh, articulating what's actually the expected performance, setting the organizational values, explaining the organizational values. These are leadership role. Now, uh, your question about what is the leadership role in uh, human resources, uh, it's essential. They actually set the tune, they just bring the motivation, they give the example. They give the, the example how they should practice things. By the way, leadership is not about, this is one of the thinking of the nice book, uh, the, the Tao of Leadership. Leader, leadership is not actually telling people what to do. It's just showing them this exercising this by in front practice. of this by practice leading by example is very important otherwise it will just end up with maybe some nice words that nobody will believe in it so the human uh, resources is led not only by the hr manager they are led by the board of directors probably the seniors around their relationships the behavior they do the, ex the, the dialogue they have okay this is very essential examples for the workers to follow and to build their own style of leadership as well. It's about organizational culture. Right. Okay, let's take a short break and come back to continue our discussion. Stay tuned. Welcome back, dear listeners, to this episode of Saudi Evenings. Tonight we are joined by Mr. Aqil, Mohammed Aqil, the uh, management consultant, and we're talking about the management issues. Uh, Mr. Aqil, we tackled some points uh, since the beginning of this episode, and now probably it's about time to talk about the experiences of the giant companies probably or the organizations in the business domain. I mean, what kind of ups and downs those organizations uh, were vulnerable to and how they face the problem sometimes and how can they, you know, penetrate the market probably by adopting a change, either it's within the company or outside of the company. And maybe we can talk about some examples in this, in this field, mm -hmm. if you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much. This is very good to make some kind of a practice in addition to the theory. Uh, as we know, organizations are maybe sophisticated systems of human resources, processes, products, machinery, whatever. And they are actually doing well for a certain time. Sometimes they will have like diseases or some kind of 
low performance because of many reasons. So we have to think of organization as a living body. And it's a living body, by the way. And uh, encounter whatever uh, human encounter of terms of, you know, good attitude, good mode, bad mode. Uh, maybe there are some uh, high morals, rom low morals. Uh, one of the good examples that uh, how organizations grow to become like dinosaurs is uh, the story of Xerox, which is a, a photocopying uh, machine. Maybe in the mid 60s, they launched this to the market and they not only just produced some new technology, they produced or they launched a new business model to serve this uh, new technology because uh, many organizations at this time felt that they don't want to maybe invest in you in, in uh, Xerox machine, which is the photocopying machine. So they launched the model that you just have it in your place. We will be charging you by number of COVID pages. Then there is Xeroxing. Some of the historians actually in the management, they called it the Xeroxing age. It's like the email, uh, you know, shots. It's like similarly right now what we encounter from the WhatsApp. Everybody is just sharing whatever he receive and it's a kind of cycle. Now Xerox, when they started this business, they were actually elite and they are the first mover in the market and uh, they grow to become a sophisticated organization. So many workers, so many subunits, subdivisions, uh, different teams for innovation, for production, but sadly they fail with all this together to maintain their competitive edge. Uh, day by day, month by month, uh, Japanese start like Minolta, like Sharp, start actually penetrating the market and actually growing their, uh, let's say, sales in front of them while Xerox was going backward. And then they hired one uh, CEO who start by dismantling this huge body, Xerox, this sophisticated organization because it's not any more sophisticated. It's became complicated body of... Uh, so uh, another example, in, uh, for example, IBM, when they actually have become on top of technology during the 70s, and they were actually number one in uh, many computers and many frames, and they have the strategy or the, based on the assumption that the mainframe will continue to be the future of the technology. They don't think that the microcomputers, which actually started from maybe very small and young initiatives around the globe, from Britain, there were the Sinclair, from uh, Japan, there were lots of manufacturers. If you remember the Sakhir machine, the MSX machines. Uh, day after day, then uh, Apple came with their uh, Melisa, then the Apple II, uh, the market in front of IBM start having a challenge in front of the PCs and personal computers. So they thought the CEO at this point wanted to bring something and to be part of this competition on uh, microcomputers. But he know that the human resources you have, they are very well talented and they own the technology, but they will fail to cooperate and to manage uh, producing a new and at that point, he decided to be part of the game by outsourcing this to Intel in terms of processor and Microsoft in terms of operating system. At that point, during the 70s, those were companies were so small and just young initiatives by, you know, entrepreneurs. But uh, IBM, by uh, this movement, they create a huge competitor for themselves. Now, this is where actually human resources plus the leadership play a role in actually sustaining the competitiveness of the organization, building the capabilities and the talents for the future, and not insisting on maybe one strategy that works fine for a certain period of time, but it might not for the coming future. So future is not extension of the past, not necessarily future is actually a kind of imitation of the past. No, it's something sometimes totally different, and we have to be ready by our leadership, by our uh, faithful resources to just be part of it and make it eventually. Thank you. Right. Well, this is very uh, enlightening stories, actually. Uh, the business uh, usually is the place for such stories. Definitely. Success, either it's success or failure. Yeah. Right. Since we are talking about the uh, management issues or the organizational uh, management issues, uh, probably it's uh, education is very important for the mm -hmm. employees. And it's uh, very important for the organization or the company 
to keep the education as part or essential part of the HR process because most of the workplaces are changing most of the time, adopting to new things. So without continuous education, I think there will be sometimes an obstacle here or there in the company or the organization because they are not keeping up with the new things, either by equipping their employees or bringing new systems or you know programs or whatever. How can we tackle this from the HR point of view? Well, this is very interesting. You know, education, uh, let us uh, start uh, or just replace it by learning. Learning because, is, because is education, the best way. Yes. You know, there are, of course, lots of debate about the differences, but uh, I feel learning is the continuous process since the person actually, or maybe since early childhood to the maybe end of life, we, st we continue to learn, we continue to learn. Part of this learning is the formal education we take maybe from uh, in, uh, during scholastic years, then we can maybe uh, go for higher education. And uh, this education is just trying to build lots of capabilities, uh, anticipate set of skills during the scholastic years or even after in the uh, you know higher education or on the job the training where we actually continue sending employees and let them be exposed to various you know spectrum of education or let's say learning of course they have their own learning curve as well when the when the organization hire one person day by day he learn by uh, watching TV, he learned something. By uh, discussing certain topics in the evening with his fellow on a cup of coffee or something, he also learned new things and may bring it back to his organization. Maybe he read a book. Maybe he uh, just uh, be part of a conference. The learning is continuous and endless and uh, diversified. Uh, now, this actually may bring us to what we call knowledge management in the organization level, where we need to make some, you know, curious organization would love to officialize the learning in the organization and not uh, allow it to be like lousy process or even not directed well or not, uh, you know, channeled in the right channels to just benefit the organization because we don't want our employees to just learn everything that actually sometimes end with nothing. We need the organization to help our workers or employees learn the right things uh, they love, first of all. They need to just belong to this. They need to feel the attraction to start learning a new thing. Otherwise, they will just find it like, I'm okay, to this week, where is Mr. XYZ? He's in the training course. Okay, then he will come back, but nothing will change. Probably he enjoyed a few days, but we need to just make the education or the learning something integrated to our needs and talents and the skills building. And we have to make the organization or the, or the employee feel and understand the, the importance of this investment. We are actually giving you this opportunity to learn. This will satisfy certain needs in your you know, job and career life. On the other hand, the organization have certain needs. One of the nice and very important examples in this uh, topic is the 3M. You know very well the company of 3M. 3M, one of the old companies in uh, a book, a very famous book, Built to Last. It's by uh, two famous uh, Jim Collins and his colleague. And this book uh, launched in maybe 1992. They said 3M having around 20,000 uh, patent, okay, registered patent during the 1992. How they make this patent? Part of the, uh, the authors mentioned that part of the organization culture in 3M company is to allow or to offer the worker maybe two or three hours uh, a day to innovate, to learn something new and to practice, supported with uh, some budget. But where is the, the surprise when he produced something nice, like the posted notes, like the many, many various topics in, you know, everything in pharmaceuticals, you can find things in, uh, in, in agriculture. At that point, when he succeeded in doing something, he will become a partner in the organization or the subunit that will start producing this product. So he will move from, uh, let's say, employee level with specific salary to owner of a certain you know, stocks in this new invention. 
By this, they actually built 20,000 plus patent. This is a very nice lesson to learn from. Thank this you. is a very successful story. Uh, and it's, it's about right time, actually, because our program is almost uh, going to end. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Aqal Muhammad Aqal, the management consultant, for the time and the uh, very, uh, very nice information, actually, that you have submitted tonight in this episode. Thank you very much. You're welcome. With that, dear listeners, we come to the end of this uh, episode of Saudi Evenings. Uh, so please accept all wishes from our director uh, tonight, Mr. Mohammed Mdayani. And until we meet, inshallah, next week, another episode of this program, this is your host, Abdurrahman bin Mohammed Hussaini, wishing you a good night. Thank you and goodbye. We have just brought to you Economy Report. Economy Report. Join us again next week, only on Saudi Radio. Saudi Radio.